Okay. Um, so I was just mentioning that uh, the last week I have uh, not been focusing on the SES level at all. I've been focusing on um, the uh, e-rights and smart contracting layers of the Agoric stack. Um, uh, so as a result, I don't have any particular thing uh, on my plate uh, to, um, that I have in mind to talk about. Uh, so what, what uh, other topics are there that we could talk about? So there are a couple, uh, at least in my sphere of influence. Um, the modules working group and security working group for Node uh, had some discussions at the OpenJS uh, Collaborator Summit that's going on. Okay. I wasn't there I to participate. About I wasn't there to participate, but they did have some interesting feedback, uh, at least on the frozen intrinsics that we've talked about before a couple times. Okay. Um, it seems people are excited about it, which is good. Yeah, that's uh, great. Yeah. It seems it is still very difficult to use, at least with the existing ecosystem and uh, things breaking on normal assignment operators. Mm -hmm. Do we have a sense of um, what fraction of programs break? Uh, it's not huge from the static tests we've done, but it only takes one library. Uh, if you're talking at the application level, I would say a majority of node apps do oh. break do okay. to a very small number of libraries. I see, I see. But, the, but, but some libraries that are used often enough that most applications use one of those libraries. Yes, this is somewhat similar to what we saw with Lodash and okay. the uh, okay. effect on the web. Okay. Uh, but for us at least, uh, those node applications are generally not considered to be problematic in forcing upgrades because you would need to force an upgrade just to opt into this flag to begin with. Um, unlike the approach that we were taking for the web, um, right. where for the web we were seeing if we could do it without um, requiring opt-in of some kind, either new operator, new uh, evaluation scheme or something, um, we can actually tell people that they should update their libraries for Node. Okay. Okay. Well, good. Good. Um, so we're so it sounds like we do not need to retreat to the uh, to the over to the trick for working around the override mistake with accessors. Uh, we probably will. Um, uh, some of these are fundamentally kind of at odds with uh, what we're trying to do. There, in particular, are some uh, application monitoring libraries, uh, APMs, um, where they will mutate the uh, intrinsics in non-trivial ways. Some of them are surprising, and some of them are somewhat expected. Okay, uh, so, so now you're not talking about the override mistake. You're talking about a, a, a different Oh, you are. Yes, so we, we would have to deal with these libraries, which are uh, initiated at runtime, and they do not have a desire to change that after wait, wait, wait. Uh, Sorry, you said they modified the intrinsics. Yes. But if, the, but if the intrinsics are all frozen, their inability to modify them is not due to the override mistake, it's due to the fact that they're frozen. Am I misunderstanding? Uh, you are not misunderstanding, but there is a space for polyfills and stuff like that that we are exploring for things prior to the freeze. Okay. Does that make okay. sense? Uh, so uh, I believe it does. I mean, that, that's been the way we've structured uh, SES, the, you know, the SES plan and the SES shim is that um, uh, the code that's setting up the environment can run vetted shims um, uh, before freezing, uh, the vetted, and I say vetted because everything's vulnerable to those things. So if those things are uh, misbehave in a way that damages things, uh, then they damage things. Um, but okay, so you run vetted shims, 
Uh, and then you freeze the resulting, what you take to be the primordials. Um, uh, and uh, it's only after that that you then load untrusted code. So basically the time right. period before you do the freeze uh, is sort of like a Unix single user mode. You're not ready for the outside world to enter yet. Or another comparison that, that um, I like is um, you're puttering around in your shop before you open the doors in the morning, um, getting things ready for customers. Um, and then you do the freeze and now you're ready for customers. Um, uh, so, uh, so yeah, that, that's, that's why we've actually structured the uh, SES and the SES shim uh, so that uh, we've got a separate freeze operation and the environment is not actually born frozen uh, right at the outset. It's, 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 it runs, you register the shims, it, it runs those registered shims before freezing and only after running the registered shims, then it does the freezing. Yes. Um, so the concern here, at least with APMs, is they're doing things like modifying the promise prototypes and stuff for tracking or uh, context purposes, where they're carrying data across async contexts. Which is almost um, certainly unsafe, right? I mean, it sort of breaks the invariant that you want for the, the, the reason why, I, you know, the vetting criteria should be such that anything that does what you just described, uh, if it does it in a leaky manner, should fail the vetting. Uh, I believe that would be true even of some security products in the node spaces. They would fail that kind of vetting. Right. Um, so we have some feedback and pushback from those kinds of things. Mm -hmm. There was an interesting case that we break if we enable the flag, which I had never seen before, is people were trying to track primitives, in particular strings as they were propagating across async stacks. Um, they do some very gross work to do that. I don't well, what, do you, what do you mean by tracking a primitive? They would convert all primitive strings into string wrappers in this case using some gross stuff. There's no way they, that they're they doing that transparently. Weak map it. Um, no, it's not transparent, but it is okay. mostly transparent to most code. Ugh. Um, anyway, there's pushback from there. Um, I do think it is going to increase the further we push forward with frozen intrinsics. We also do have some pushback from some library authors, uh, in part because uh, some philosophical differences of that's how the spec should work, um, where uh, there they do not understand why it is, the onus is on the library author to fix a problem that is allowed by the spec to begin with. Does that make sense? The, the, the mode that we're talking, uh, I'm not sure yet. The, the, there's something that's confusing me. Uh, the mode that we're talking about um, uh, would not be on by default. It would, I mean, it would not, uh, it, there was, there's, you would have, there's a, there's a flag or something that would, where you have to opt in and the opt in would be explicit. Is that correct? At the application level, yes. Okay, so, um, so in that case, the fact that the that some old things break in the new world shouldn't be a fatal problem, even a fatal problem for those old things. Uh, the pushback is that the library authors do not want to change their code since it works if people do not opt in. So the, the counter recommendation, we saw this as well with a uh, event that Node has that notifies applications if promises have multiple rejections and re re resolutions. Um, 
uh, some library authors believe it is a means of uh, telling the runtime that it should not behave that way by uh, having popular libraries not uh, encourage uh, any of those such warnings or stuff. They do not want those warnings because uh, it's allowed by the spec if you don't opt in. Mm -hmm. um, so, so I think what I'm confused about is nothing. I don't think I'm confused about anything technical. I'm confused about the politics of this. Um, do this the per, the purpose of of opting in is it understood that the reason why an application would want to opt in is in order to get security properties such as being able to do least authority linkage of libraries the theory is understood but the uh, pushback is on how it is being accomplished. Okay. Um, so if the theory is understood and the thing that a library wants to do, if it were allowed to do it, would destroy the security property, which was the motivation for the application opting in in the first place, isn't it sort of clear that the application author then has a choice? I can either use a library that requires the application to be insecure, or uh, I can use the secure mode, in which case I can't use a library that whose functionality, you know, it's not just the way the library is written, it's the, it's the form of the functionality that the, app, that the library provides, basically, you can think of the library as providing an attack. Um, uh, and if I want to be secure, I can't load a library that whose purpose is to enable an attack. Uh, I do not think that there is the same viewpoint going on. I think the viewpoint going on is a question of why can't it be fixed in a way that the library doesn't need to update its code. We've had in the past some talk about changing the spec, which we found to be problematic for web compatibility reasons. Uh, and I think the idea of introducing a different operator appeals to some people uh, or just going I'm forward sorry. with the web breakage appeals. I'm sorry, to some a different people. operator for what? Uh, well, there are different kinds that I've heard about while talking to people. Um, Gus Kaplan wants to have an explicit defined kind of uh, assignment operators, so you would change the code uh, still. Okay, um, wait, wait. I, uh, I, so so the, the, the thing I was responding to just now was not the override mistake. It was things like uh, visibly dynamically tracking something across call contexts. Ah, uh, well, um, I don't really have a good response to that because that's their whole product. Right. That, that's, so that's the issue where I'm saying their whole product is something that in order to provide the functionality, you, it's sort of inherent in the functionality that it's, in, that it's incompatible with the security model who's, that's, that the application wanted to opt into. Right, it's like saying. Um, I mean, these are security companies. They're claiming that it isn't. Do they understand the security model? Uh, I believe they have different ideas of what the security model is. Okay. Um, this also is a fact for the web where they're going down the route of kind of interesting ways to approach trusted types and things from what we're doing. Um, in this case, they are not matching the web's model though, which I found curious. Um, okay. But that's about it. I don't really have any path forward or thing to say, but uh, it looks like we'll get somewhat prohibitive pushback as we move forward.
is it? Okay. Um, so the when we made the transition from ECMAScript three to ECMAScript five, uh, and introduced strict mode in ECMAScript five, um, uh, it the the you know it got to like four percent uptake fairly quickly, but it didn't get to majority uptake for 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 many years. Uh, but it did win in the end. Um, and, you know, initially, as long as there's a compatibility mode that you get by not opting in, and therefore um, you're not breaking old things, uh, you know, people did that in large measure. Uh, you know, 96% of uh, people did that for years. Um, but then the libraries gradually fixed themselves to be compatible with strict mode anyway, because even 4% was enough demand um, uh, and the, everybody could see the writing on the wall. So without much pressure, libraries did fix over time. And then eventually with enough libraries fixed, uh, applications started moving most of their logic to strict mode. And then of course, ECMAScript 6 with modules and classes, that was the big, that was the big victory. Um, I think, I mean, if, if our victory here is um, in terms of uptake, gradual in that way, I would still count it as a victory. I think there are still ergonomic differences. Um, strict mode largely has similar ergonomics with assignment operators, uh, at least visually or when you're writing code. Uh, with sloppy mode and the way these authors are being told to work around things is to use things like object.define property and they don't want to sprinkle that all over their code. Okay, can we separate the override mistake from all of the other security issues? Uh, I would like that, yes. Okay. Um, the, um, so, so speaking specifically about the override mistake, if the define property thing if, you know, to the degree that that becomes a really costly uh, barrier to uptake, uh, I'd be willing to do the accessor property thing. Uh, if that was really, if if that really eased these political issues to get the uh, to get the um, the override mistake, you know, mostly out of the way, get it out of the way for you know ninety plus percent of all the cases by just doing the accessor trick on. Uh, you know, four of the primordial prototypes, four or five, I don't remember what it was, the, the ones that Salesforce identified. Um, uh, and by the way, we're, we're planning to, um, we're probably going to be doing that in uh, the session that we're using at Agorix too, but not necessarily um, because we, we have much less of a legacy burden. Um, but there's nothing breaking from a security point of view by doing the accessor trick. Um, so, so we can fix the override mistake in a way that, that gets rid of the political problem, leaving only all of the rest of the political problem. None of which creates a difference in the look of the code. I think that's fine. Um, I don't think we will largely sway people who are looking for async context tracking since that's their main product. Um, they will just have to, I mean, convince people to use their product somehow. Okay. Is the async tracking, is that for debugging purposes? There's a variety of purposes. Uh, some people are using it for logging purposes. Others are using it for performance measurements. It's very rarely used for debugging. Uh, okay. A large majority of people who I've seen it, uh, I think Angular included, are doing uh, user land, uh, basically thread local using it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. We call it the context file system. Sorry, say again? Uh, I think they call it a continuation 
file system or something close to that? They call it continuation local storage in an older library, but Angular uses a form of it called zones. Zones were okay. proposed to CC39. Yeah. yeah, I remember zones. Um, so the other thing is that if we adopt the overall framework that we that we talked about, where you get where where the application can run vetted shims before freezing, then you know the application can run, um, uh, you know, can register uh, shims that actually do break our security properties, uh, and um, and then proceed to freeze, and then you have an environment in which those security properties are broken, um, uh, but the primordials are frozen and the library is not broken. Um, does that solve the political problem? I don't know without talking to people again. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. My guess. My guess is the some of these complaints are knee-jerk reactions. Okay. Uh, but I think they will continue uh, down that path until they are uh, convinced otherwise. And uh, that means convincing them uh, that something they're doing is problematic and that will be very hard. Can, how do we join this conversation or how do they join our conversation? Um, so this just started up with the OpenJS Collaborator Summit a bit, and I've just been seeing it ad hoc start up on Twitter in the past couple days, both prior to the summit and uh, as of earlier in this 24 hour period when it happened. Um, so I think the best person to get a hold of is probably Miles for now, unless maybe John. Oh. Miles Bourne? Yeah, it's, uh, I don't know how much John is doing with the security working group here. Sorry, which John? Uh, John David Dalton, sorry. I, oh, okay. I, JDD. I the, um, or JD. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, John's... So... Mm -hmm. Um, the reason I speak about JDD for this is he has probably the most uh, breadth of experience when dealing with libraries. Okay. Uh, and he's also been involved in the modules working group, which is affected somewhat by this. So. Okay. Um, so uh, JD, how do you see, how do you see this playing out? I, I mean, you, I would talk with the people that are having that you're wanting to um, meet with directly. Um, I I can't really speak for them because I don't have their their use case in mind. So, okay. I mean, just reach out to what I would do if I, if I was y'all you know, find one of the core contributors or the the primary uh, folks invested in it, and then just set up some time to talk about it. Okay. So, is Miles a good person to start with? I, I haven't followed the Twitter thread to the discussion to see which uh, folks are uh, have a problem with it. Uh, okay. It's uh, who? Around, I think Miles was there for both, so that's why he's probably useful to get a hold of because he might yeah. be able to direct. He might have some context for sure. Okay. Okay. Um, so I will be in Berlin for TC39 this coming week. Uh, uh, of the rest of us uh, here, uh, uh, who who also expects to be in Berlin? I will not be. Okay. I also will not be. Oh, okay. Well, obviously I can't be because I'm not. I'm not right. No, I understand that. Uh, I'll probably be remote for part of it. Uh, assuming I figure out the time zones. Okay. Okay. Um, okay. In that case, it's going to. Um, if, if so, if Miles isn't there, this whole topic will need to wait for me to come back, and I'm uh, in Berlin for more than two weeks altogether. Um, uh, uh, the I think the ideal thing would be to uh, have the people with these concerns join these calls on Thursday and. Uh, then we can discuss it with people that that are bringing these concerns to the table.
I think in particular, the one that we want the most is probably Doug Wilson from Express, which I can get a hold of him. Okay. I don't know. He's generally busy, but we'll see if he can make time. Okay. So let him know about the Thursday meetings and, and suggest first that the that having him bring these concerns to a Thursday meeting uh, would be the ideal way to engage. Sounds good. Okay, good. Are we ready maybe for a change of topic? I think so. Uh, yep. Okay, Mark, I was just out of curiosity glancing at the, <laughs> at the TC39 agendas because I figured, well, the meeting should have been this week, but it turns out it's next week. But I also noticed there you have a, uh, a talk scheduled about ECMAScript security. I was wondering oh. if you might be inclined to do a dry run with us uh, this afternoon, today. Uh, so uh, what? I, so I, I've been meaning to, um, uh, because so many of the people who want to be there uh, can are not going to Berlin. What I'm actually going to do is postpone that to the next meeting, which is end of July. Okay, I was just curious. Yeah, I also have another half hour which I'm planning to to proceed with. Uh, but I don't have anything prepared yet. And I don't think it needs a dry run, which is um, uh, what to do about basically reforming Annex B. Uh, Annex B is the, um, uh, the part of the spec um, uh, that's labeled um, uh, normative optional. Uh, and what, that, what, what we mean by normative optional um, is, well, it's actually, it's two things. I'm, the, what we mean by normative optional is that uh, a conforming engine can omit the feature, but if the feature is present, then it must behave as described. Uh, the additional thing about Annex B uh, is that it says, it has this peculiar language about it's actually required in a browser um, without defining what it means to be a browser. Um, uh, so there's, there's an, in, an incoherence there. Um, uh, and there's a whole bunch of things in Annex B that are sort of the, became the dumping ground for things that just seemed too unclean to be in the main body of the standard is, is part of how things got there. Um, and part of the, how things got there is just that they were, they, they, they have been there for a very long time. So nobody thought to move them out of there. Um, uh, the way I see it is there's a few things there that are genuinely unsafe that I, I, I made sure were an Annex B because one of the things that SES does on startup is to remove those things from the primordials. Uh, and I also uh, made sure they were specified in Annex B in such a manner that they were removable. So for example, the uh, statics on the regex constructor, that is this global communications channel um, uh, that is side affected every time a regex instance is ma matches something, it leaves behind this residue about the match in the static properties on the regex constructor. Um, so that's an Annex B. It's an Annex B as deletable. And that means that once deleted, it means that SES can always delete them. And once deleted, the resulting system is still a conforming system because uh, um, it's not a conforming browser system, but it's a conforming ECMAScript system. Uh, there's other things in there that are universally impl implemented um, and perfectly safe uh, that I'm gonna propose we promote to the main spec because if they're universally implemented and safe, then it's just part of reality and we should acknowledge that by moving into the main spec. Nobody, nobody actually has the, the ability to omit them. And the, the clearest example of, um, of 
uh, safe is the weird HTML methods um, in string.prototype. Um, uh, so, you know, there's a, um, you know, string.prototype.bold or something. Um, and they're all just very simple string to string manipulation things. There's nothing unsafe about them. There's nothing that's different about them from one platform to another. Um, so they should just get promoted. And then there's the category of things that are specific to sloppy mode, some of which would be unsafe if they were, they were not specific to sloppy mode, but because any safe environment is going to turn sloppy mode off anyway, anything that's already specific to sloppy mode um, uh, might as well get promoted into the main spec, or, or rather, I don't care if it gets promoted into the main spec or not, but I wanna make it clear that everybody understands there's no safety reason to keep them out of the main spec uh, because they're already kept out of strict mode by their own text. And um, so that's, that's essentially the NXB reform. And I remember I, I, somewhere I have an inventory where I went through all of NXB and the number of things that do not get promoted into the main spec are tiny. Uh, most of NXB just gets promoted. And, there, and that makes NXB a sort of a, a, have a much clearer purpose. Definitely sounds interesting. Um, I mean, this is just my personal opinion. But those uh, HTML methods of string dot prototype, I'm not sure they even make sense in the modern world anymore. We're, not everybody runs inside a browser anymore. There are many things in JavaScript that don't make sense, but uh, all implementers feel obligated to implement them. No one's going to ship an engine without them. And therefore, code that considers itself to be host independent portable JavaScript code. Uh, uh, feels free to rely on those things. Um, and, you know, uh, and, the, and that kind of universality by itself isn't enough to get promoted into the main spec. But if you've got that universality and it's completely safe, I'm going to suggest we promote it to the main spec. The, 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 the ugliest thing that I remember off the top of my head um, that's in the category where I'm going to recommend promoting it to the main spec, uh, and I expect resistance, is underbar, underbar, proto, underbar, underbar. Um, uh, the, yeah. Uh, yeah, the thing for uh, changing, um, uh, uh, changing the inheritance tree. Um, uh, the thing is we also have reflect dot set prototype of, uh, because in order to have admitted the ability to change prototypes at all, you have to make that work through proxies, which means it has to trap, which means the proxies have to, un the, the handler has to be able to unreflect it. So it's got, so it's already, so, and the, the thing that's on reflect, that's already in the main spec. So the underbar, the dunder proto accessor on object.prototype, keeping that in annex B, did not keep mutable prototype chains out of the main spec, just kept one mechanism for expressing it out of the main spec. And since it's universal, um, uh, I think it should just be promoted. And I think that was, unless somebody has a question, I think that was all I had to say on that topic. Okay. Um, so I did want to talk about tofu sometime. Oh, good, good. Uh, tofu's, to, yes, I'd love to tofu talk about tofu. Is been sitting there. Uh, we did have some requests for more. 
information. Because, because it's been a while since we talked about it, does everybody on does anybody on the call not know what tofu is? I have no idea off the top of my head. Uh, neither okay. do I. Okay. So Bradley, take it from the top. Sure. Um, so what tofu is is it's just a auditing tool uh, that basically takes in JavaScript source, parses it very generously and tries to see what the possible usage of globals and modules is. Um, a fair amount of time, your modules can end up into a dynamic state or your globals can end up into a dynamic state in which the tool will roughly state, you could be using ambient authority, meaning anything. Um, so, We've run this tool in the past on modules in the wild and things on NPM to see kind of what different authority it's trying to get a hold of to do various tasks. Um, it does this roughly by making a large dump of JSON output for mapping uh, different packages to uh, the sum of authorities. Uh, that they try to access. Well, in the past, we've kind of done this ad hoc without a full listing of the data that we want. And a couple meetings ago, we did have mention of wanting more data. I was wondering if we could actually create a list of all the data we want uh, so that we could properly document what we need to get a hold of and why. Good. Um, on that note, there's another thing as well that we probably want for Tofu. Um, we can uh, swap it over to the TypeScript parser if we want. Um, Babel does support uh, the TypeScript syntax, but I can get a little bit more information out of the Babel compiler uh, for some things like flow, but I can't get the actual value constraints that I could get out of the TypeScript parser and compiler. So my thought is once we get this list of data, we'll actually rewrite it to run against the TypeScript type checker and parser instead. You won't be able to have as many experimental syntaxes, but I think that's okay. If, I was wondering what people thought about that, if we can't use as many syntax extensions. So, so let's, let's take TypeScript as an example, as a clear example for the question I'm about to ask, and, and then we can think about other languages that compile to JavaScript. Um, uh, for purposes of tofu, for the, the analysis that tofu does, uh, if uh, for a code that's in TypeScript, if you apply the tofu analysis after compiling to JavaScript rather than compiling it, rather than applying tofu to the sources, uh, would would that result in any imprecision of the of the result of the, the tofu analysis? It does, particularly for modules. Um, so there are a lot of compiler options on TypeScript for what they generate from modules. So it is hard to track it. Sorry, uh, I, I, um, are Bradley, you're still there? Ah. I'm here. Uh, the baby was crying. Uh, okay. So there is a combination of things that happen if we do it on the compiled output. One is we do have some loss of information, uh, which mm, it's bearable for TypeScript to JavaScript. Other languages, it can get really bad. Um, can you give me an example? A pure script or live script, um, coffee script as well. Uh, anything that does more and more code transforms. Babel is pretty bad. Uh, just because they do a lot of calling out to runtime stuff. And once you start ah, calling to runtime okay. stuff, you start losing things. Got it, got it, got um, it. But 
Babel and stuff, they're mostly about these code transforms. TypeScript in particular has very fiddly bits when it comes to compiling how modules work. There are a lot of different options for the kind of output for your TypeScript compiler. They have many different target combinations. Um, and that's where you start to lose information, is particularly on how modules are uh, being exported and imported. So, um, so, would, so in terms of development strategy, um, it seems like it would make sense to start by uh, only analyzing the output of the transformations, i.e. Only, only analyzing JavaScript itself to start, and then uh, uh, you know, only do so, more work uh, as driven by the, the uh, is driven by actual pain caused by the imprecision. So that is still the plan of to only analyze JavaScript, but the TypeScript compiler does have full support for parsing and checking JavaScript files without using .ts. That's oh, what okay. we do with GoDaddy, actually. We don't use any .ts files. I did not know that TypeScript had full support for JavaScript. Uh, it uses an inference engine, however, there. And the type system is slightly different. Um, I am talking to them actively about uh, ironing out and documenting the differences. Huh. But yes, uh, no, that's what you see in editors that use uh, completions for JS files, for huh. VS Code uh, and other stuff. Okay. Uh, does that mean that, um, uh, so, so t you would use TypeScript to, to generate an a AST that Tofu would then process? Uh, so TypeScript, we already have an AST. That's not really what we'd gain from doing this. Uh, what we'd gain from doing this is we'd gain access to TypeScript's type checker, okay. least, which sometimes can do things like type of constraints and ensure okay. that strings or ensure that it's a specific string and things like that. Now ty TypeScript, both Flow and TypeScript are not sound. Um, they, um, the biggest problem I run into TypeScript outside of TypeScript syntax is the handling of symbols. Um, their property keys uh, seem to have like some uh, layered logic that evolved over time, and they can't seem to figure out um, um, key of uh, things that are not um, um, uh, strings. Uh, you, you know, like, like uh, they, they struggle with symbols. And the other thing they struggle with is static members, like members of constructors. Those are the two uh, downsides of TypeScript in my, uh, of TypeScript in my experience. Okay. Um, but even, oh. even as aside from those things, they, they don't claim that it's sound. Uh, they're I very, they're a, very... I want to make an argument that them being unsound is okay for this use case. Right. Go ahead. Um, so even though they are unsound, uh, what this tool is doing is seeking to provide the minimal expected authority. Right, right, uh, right, right, right. So if it generates a manifest that has too few permissions, yeah. that's still acceptable to me for tofu. No, you're right. You're right. The to tofu is, yes, good, good, yes. For the purpose of tofu, um, where we're trying to generate like manifests and configuration so that nothing, so that typically nothing breaks. Um, but we, but we um, can catch any increase in, in authority after, you know, for, for later versions compared to the version that we analyze. Yes. Um, this yeah. change would only be used for narrowing uh, things like yeah. dynamic behavior. Okay, good, good. So, the scope analysis that Tofu does, supplemented by unsound type inference, um, that's interesting. It would only be using the unsound inference in order to constrain, though, to be very clear. I never want to expand uh, something. So I would never take a required okay, of FS or import of FS and treat it as dynamic from this. 
would only be things that we cannot resolve statically that we would jump into the inference engine and try to constrain more. Okay. The unsoundness actually helps us here a little bit just because we do have an any type that TypeScript will use if it's confused as well. Yeah. Mm. Yep. Can you give me an example of a further narrowing that you can do with types? Sure. So TypeScript has the ability to declare what uh, are enums. Uh, enums generally are backed by strings in TypeScript. Mm -hmm. And so you can reduce at least some usage of things like dynamic imports and the such uh, or require or property access on the globals saying that, oh, this has to be one of these keys. So for web reasons or anything else, you may have different prefixes about vendored versions of APIs and you want just one of them that works. Uh, we could reduce the dynamic behavior from a full on any key to, oh, it's expecting one of these three keys. Okay, okay, good. Way that works a little bit better ergonomically. Good. We could already do this with some if else branching, but that would be kind of uh, strange to see in the wild. Okay. Versus using an array or something. Just yeah, and modern types, modern TypeScript also has uh, some kind of guard syntax where it, it actually does do a runtime check, but it's understood that the different branches of, I mean, it's, it's, it's understood that the runtime check corresponds to static types so that it can statically type the branches of the resulting condition. Yeah. I, I can expand on that. So basically, if you run a function that, set, that gives a return type of something is array, for example, or something is my, my interface, then when that function returns true or false, it will modify the type of the, the argument that it's been run on. In that branch, I should I should explain this a little bit as well. So TypeScript doesn't really do types on a binding level; it does it more on a location level. If you look at their APIs, so whenever you're querying types, you have to specify where this is. So all their tracking of what they call symbols, uh, which is kind of the typing container for values, is done with location as part of its primary key. Okay. So within that branch, the binding uh, has a symbol for that location. And that is what you query against. You never query against the binding itself. I you see. only query against these location sensitive symbols. Okay. And, uh, and you can use TypeScript to get some type inference just on plain JavaScript. It's the same, it's, so it's the... Yes, uh, we are currently working on writing a full type dumper GoDaddy, and that's where we learned about this. Okay. So yes, um, if we could just make a document or something or some location to centralize our total aggregate of the data and any constraints we have to avoid uh, narrowing something that we don't want narrowed, that would be good for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So are you like plan planning to run tofu over like you know all the npm packages or something in some large corpus uh i will probably end up doing that once i get a little further ahead with a few things in node prs so this is more an eventual plan uh we can run it over the corpus of npm however the uh usage of webpack and things makes it fail spectacularly for some things where people are injecting things through webpack config rather than oh. the source text itself. Okay. A good example of this would be things like supporting importing CSS files.
um, Tofu is not really prepared to try to handle all the Webpack loader mechanisms. Um, we could try to parse and evaluate Webpack uh, configs, but they allow arbitrary code execution, which I'm not super thrilled at the idea of. Uh huh. So Webpack, so Webpack itself is the name of a packager, and that's you know, uh, like Rollup is a packager. It's the same category of thing. Yes, okay. uh, but the same still holds true for people doing custom Babel uh, transforms and stuff like that. Okay. They are not common, but the complexity of supporting them is enough that I would not like to do so. Okay. So what is the current state of Tofu? I mean, it works. It's been working for several months. I started to rewrite it for a while, and then I had a baby. Uh, so <laughs> that's mostly it. OK. Congratulations on the baby. Uh, yeah, you might hear her whining during the call. Sorry. Um, for the most part, the rewrite was to change it so that it could be uh, split out into workers. Uh, right now, it does take a prohibitive amount of time to run on a large code base, um, which might be acceptable, might not be. But uh, once you get into code bases with the tens of thousands of files, which we do see, it takes you know at least twenty minutes. <laughs> Is it non-linear? Uh, it's fairly linear. Okay. Um, it can be nonlinear if you have a super complex dependency graph. But as long as you don't go super deep, I mean, you're not going to get the compounding effect that you'd, you'd think of is truly bad. So, so it's doing intramodule analysis, is that correct? Yes, it has to for things like export star from. Ah. Ah. Yep. I so wish we had left star out of the, well. Any other questions? Um, the goal of Tofu remains to eventually get it to output something that can be consumed directly by the runtime on my side. Um, I don't know if it makes sense to declare standardized format as we declare those data points uh, that can be shared across both the runtime and SES. So I think, I think we're, we are going to be standardizing some kind of manifest or configuration file for SES for doing all the least authority module wiring. Um, uh, uh, and I think what we're going to do at that point is just have there be a separate program that takes in whatever tofu outputs and then generates an SES configuration from that. So I, th I don't think that's going to be, that shouldn't be very constraining on uh, tofu itself as long as, as long as the information is, is, is present and adequately available, then um, you know, we can transform it into whatever form we want to present it for SES purposes. And the, the two things that we'll be keeping our eye on there to be like, or at least not gratuitously unlike, uh, is the uh, import map thing as, as, a, you know, as an existing way to express uh, module renaming and rewiring uh, and the XS uh, configuration stuff. Um, uh, but, you know, the, I expect the XS stuff uh, for the 
uh, SES form of excess, um, you know, that, that, will, that will work directly with them to make sure we arrive at a common format there for the, uh, the SES level rewiring, because they, they want to support SES directly. Okay, then I'm not gonna really prioritize standardizing a format, just the data points. Yep, yep. We did, we did talk about having more in-depth analysis about property access instead of just globals. I don't know if we still care about that. We do, we do. Uh, that is mostly what I need to understand. We don't really have that documented anywhere to my knowledge. Okay. Okay, I think I can uh, uh, talk it out here, um, which oh. is, um, and, you know, this is, and this actually is a great example of something that's uh, not sound analysis, but it's sound enough for the pur purposes of tofu. Um, so uh, in the, um, in Kate's example, the, um, uh, there was a, what is it, is it process? Yeah, process is the node global. And then you take a look at um, the uses of process and the code we were analyzing. And it was clear that uh, it was only, you know, process dot something dot something uh, that was actually being accessed. Um, and uh, so if you just, you know, basically, track all uses of the global and see that the only use being made of it uh, is to access named properties from it, that the global, that the, that the, na that the named thing, that, that you know, the named value is not itself escaping into, um, you know, uh, so it's never passed as a parameter. Basically it's never re it's never itself reified. There's no, no, no code that, has a hold of that of that value without knowing that that's what it is, um, uh, and then you see that it's and so it, at that point you can pretty much infer that um, uh, that object is being used as a record. Only those fields of the record are being used, um, and you know which modules are using which fields, and then a least authority attenuation of that. Um, can go ahead and present um, replacement records that only contain a copy of the fields that Tofu said were being used. And that's pretty much what we did manually with the process attenuation. So yes, right now this would be a manual process. We could automate it to some extent. Uh, what, what should happen across module boundaries though? So, um, so in the case of a, um, genuine global like process, um, uh, 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 it's the, you know, if, if one module is accessing process.foo, another module is accessing process.bar, then the result of the uh, CES configuration uh, generated from that TOFU information is that um, uh, the first module would be running in a compartment whose process global only had process.foo, and the other one would be running in a compartment whose, glo whose process global only had process.bar. So you would just populate them with only the fields that they were that that were being that seemed to be being used, and you decide to do this based on seeing that that the variable itself does not escape. So the only things that are being accessed from it are the things that are being visibly accessed. Um, uh, so so in that sense, you don't actually expose the original value at all. You only expose new records that have copies of those fields? Uh, I think that 
makes sense. Uh, my concern here is when we pass globals around, um, sometimes right. people use it for configuration, like they might press, pass process.env to a helper library that'll process it, filter out something or do something else before returning it to the original module. Well, so at, the, at this point, it becomes an issue of, of how, um, how ambitious do you want to get with your static analysis? Um, uh, I'm fine leaving it as marked as complex, which is what it currently does. Okay, and complex meaning I give up. Yes, it means roughly ambient authority on whatever it's talking about. Right, okay. So if you see it being passed as a parameter and you then give up, then you don't have to do interprocedural analysis. Yep. And if we're okay with that, that's what I think I will do. Uh, I'm, personally okay. Okay. I'm the, personally okay even leaving the globals as marked as complex, but meh. So the, so the, the nice thing about Node is that there's so few powerful globals. There's basically just um, uh, you know, process and array buffer. Uh, and then there's, you know, require is a powerful global, of course, but we, we, we processed require specially. We don't consider it to be global. We consider it to be the subject of our, of our static analysis based on, on thinking of it as a keyword for the module system. Um, so, um, so, the, so uh, an array buffer is, is, is the class array buffer that's global, so that's not dangerous. Um, so, so that, so that form of, of analysis is actually low priority for Node because of the absence of globals. Uh, it would be high priority for the web, but, you're, but I don't know that, that um, you care about Tofu for web code. Uh, we care about, you know, I mean, just in general for SES, we care about um, least authority linkage for web code. Um, uh, and Tofu that does this kind of module field tracking would be very useful for the web because, you know, you see that the only use made of document is to get, you know, document dot something dot something. That tells you a lot. Um, uh, so, so for the web, it would be useful. Um, uh, now, for things obtained from require, I think it's probably also useful as well. Like um, you import, uh, let, let's take the egregious example. Um, you import FS. No, FS is too is too powerful to be an example of this principle. Um, so my thought would be something like HTTP, where you only perform outgoing requests rather than. Allowing. Okay. Okay. Good. Good. So you can do that by field tracking, by method tracking in that case. Uh, and then provide an, to that module an HTTP that only has those methods. Um, and that would be a good, um, you know, initial default attenuation um, that shouldn't break things, uh, but enables you to catch, um, uh, you know, later upgrades of authority. So we can do this. Um, it is not uh, going to be simple. My concern is in part actually from explosive memory usage for large code bases. So we'll need to find a way to split up the work. So are you talking about memory usage inside Tofu at the time you're running Tofu? Yes. Okay. Um, having to track all of the possible variables that could be intertwined. So uh, we could also just declare that we don't do this for computed property access, I guess. Oh, for computed property access, yeah, yeah. I was, I was, I was thinking that I mean, like with square brackets, 
yeah, I was I was figuring that we would give up in those cases. Uh, we currently do for most things. I think right now we still have some symbols that are respected. Ah, um, symbols, right. Symbols can only use the square bracket notation. And to what degree do you find people are actually using symbols? Uh, it varies place to place. I think most people using symbols are treating it as a means of privacy rather than a means of non-collision. Uh, weak privacy. So what if whenever we just, what if we did just give up whenever we saw square brackets? How much would that break? I mean, I don't think it'll break much. Uh, a lot of people don't use symbols and are just using things like for of directly. Yeah. You can just shortcut that. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think with something like tofu, the, the you know, um, start off, um, you know, shortening the development time by just being imprecise everywhere you don't know how much the cost of being imprecise is, and then we'll find out. Okay, well, we can do this then. Um, we'll probably also have some other bailouts for things where they do complex library functions on enter uh, module behavior, but that doesn't seem, I don't think it'll be as bad uh, in reality as it sounds. But I've got to go. The baby's angry, so I'll see you later. Bye, baby. Okay, uh, other topics. So if there are no other topics. Um, I'm just, um, I wanted to run uh, for, for, for sanity, uh, the idea of the parsing work that I've been working on. Okay. And the goal of this is to be able to safely mutate aspects of source text um, that, um, you know, without, without having to have a full AST, um, Good examples would be um, if you're um, rewriting the from clause for uh, import and export declarations, mm -hmm. uh, you, you don't necessarily need to know everything about everything in the code. You just okay. need to know enough that this uh, particular string is a, a module reference. Mm -hmm. um, so um, I'm just going to share my screen very quickly. Okay, good. All right, so so um, I'm just going to uh, you know show um, the earlier work I did on on a, on a on parsing JavaScript, and the intent wasn't to parse it correctly, but rather to build a uh, parsing infrastructure that works for more than just JavaScript um, that allows me to nest different syntaxes like JavaScript, HTML, and CSS mainly. Um, and that parser, it was purely declarative. It only used a regular expression, um, 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 you know, an object with various uh, regular expressions and, and lookups like uh, sets or arrays to define a syntax. Um, and obviously the lack of uh, being able to write logic meant that a regular expression was matched by uh, hitting a solidus and looking, uh, you know, forward-looking, basically, look-aheads. Um, a, a logic which is flawed to parse JavaScript, but not flawed to maybe, um, you know, just um, syntax highlight or something in many cases. Um, so, so in this approach, obviously, the, uh, the, the, the selling point of this is that it's extremely fast. 
um, it's very flawed, but you know, um, you can optimize it and you know, you can run through um, this entire length um, in, in, you know, time that is, you know, so, so if that works for you, you know, well and good, but I don't think that should be a good way to parse anything. Um, right, right. For, for SES purposes, uh, something like a, you know, like this parser in terms of its output um, would be very useful because except for imports and exports, the way we want to do modules uh, leaves all of the other text literally as is, and it doesn't need to be parsed. So, that, so that's very attractive about this approach. Yeah. Uh, but for SES purposes, the, pr the, the code that we're parsing is written by the adversary. Exactly. exactly. So, so, so we have to have an accurate parser. We cannot have imprecision on the parser. Yeah. So, so I borrowed your idea of, of um, uh, in, in um, um, uh, quasi tag where, uh, like I wanted declarative and I ended up making uh, concepts that are, I thought were very intuitive after I thought about them for a few months. So they're obviously not intuitive. But when I look at your quasi peg, although like I'm not like a person that thinks in peg terms at all, um, um, I love the idea of like, you have an arrow function right in the middle of your expression of whatever syntax you use to define that. And that arrow function handles um, uh, the state of your tokenizer or just influences it in some way. Sorry? Yeah, I just, I was just agreeing. Yeah, so, so I thought, okay, maybe I can play around with this idea of like putting like functions inside of like regular expressions and, and, and template literals, you know, being the closest um, uh, thing. And, you know, I, I just went ahead with it. Um, and um, you also pointed me towards um, uh, Tim Disney's, um, um, yeah. you know, dissertation. Um, which was uh, an, an ES5 thing, right? Um, yeah, but the, the only additional token, the only additional lexical concern that I'm aware of uh, that, that in, was introduced after ES5 is, is, temp is template literals themselves, where and, you have to, yeah. to do bracket matching, you know, c c count the, cl identify real closed curlies and count the closed curlies if you're in a substitution hole within a template literal, so yeah. you know you've completed the substitution hole and you're back in the, in the literal part of the template. Yes. Uh, that, I think that's the only additional um, lexing concern. True, so you wanna know that a, a bracket is not inside a regular expression with absolute certainty. Um, and uh, so, so for this approach, where I can assume wrong about regular expressions because I'm not really trying, I'm, I'm looking ahead and regular expressions are determined by not looking ahead, by looking where you're standing. Um, the solidus that opens a regular expression can never be a divide. Um, um, so it, it, if it's, um, you know, if you're looking ahead to determine if you started in the right spot, then you're doing something wrong. So the only flaw in my initial design, which is super fast, is that you can, you can hijack it by just throwing closers uh, in what would appear to me as a regular expression when it's not. And that, that's, that's obviously, uh, but, but, but being able to close and open contexts, uh, tokenizing contexts, um, is something that I, I, I've you know, refined through both designs um, drastically, like it's a continuous refinement of a concept of what a context in tokenizing is. So, so at least that I can take, you know, what I learned in both designs, and I have that over here. Um, okay. Well, let me let me make sure I understand what problem you're solving. Uh, you're are you trying to be a, a an accurate parser, or are you still trying to um, just sort of get close for non-adversarial code, but you're, but I mean, so yeah, this is the question. Are you trying to solve the, adver the parsing of adversarial code examples problem or, or aren't you? Um, I, I, I'm trying to, um, depending on, first off, I'm trying to close doors where people can, uh, can, can find an inconsistent 
uh, um, uh, trait of, of the parsing approach and use that. So yes, if I misidentify a regular expression, that means that, um, that the, the, uh, the um, uh, basic um, um, design in itself is flawed. So, so I only need the tokenizer to close the door of a potentially, um, um, uh, you know, um, um, masquerading syntax, um, but, you know, because I'm go going to uh, assume it's a regular expression, I'm not going to count it or something like that. Um, I, 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 I don't think I understood. Oh, okay. So, so what, that, what, the, well, what that means with regard to my question. Are you, okay. are, are you trying to write a parser that can accurately parse maliciously constructed code examples? Yes, to the extent that you would need um, and uh, to the extent where it will not be a runtime error um, because what we need to do is change aspects of the code and give it to the runtime where it will behave as written. Um, so so, so what, what I'm trying to say is I'm not trying to catch every single trick you would uh, you would uh, put in code as if I was the runtime, um, but anything that would affect my judgment on whether or not I should be changing our, the, the import reference here, um, then yes, that, that I definitely have to know enough to uh, mutate code as needed uh, okay. without so, Okay, so I'm, I'm still... Um, <laughs> Sorry. We're... we're I'm sp speaking specifically at the lexical level. Um, at the lexical level, import is just an identifier or an identifier name or something. Um, or, 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 you know, the, um, the, the tokenizer, I mean, or it's a keyword, but fine. But, yeah. but the fact that it's part of an import declaration, the tokenizer doesn't care about import declarations. Um, the, um, the, if you don't tokenize accurately, mm -hmm. then you don't know when you see the string import, mm -hmm. am I inside a comment? Am I inside a literal string? Or is this, or am I outside those things? And this is a genuine import keyword. Yeah. Um, and, and as soon as you get out of sync about whether you're inside a literal string or outside a literal string, mm -hmm then everything else that you analyze is um, you know, maliciously constructed nonsense. Is, is it deviates, exactly. the, meaning, the meaning that you're seeing deviates from what you think it means in arbitrary ways that the constructor can use for any purpose, I mean, that the adversary can use for any purpose. Yes. So, 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 I still, so are you trying to tokenize accurately on maliciously constructed strings? Um, I definitely want to tokenize accurately. Um, and in order to do that, um, there, the one part that cannot be tokenized accurately without, uh, without uh, some uh, contextual um, uh, knowledge of syntax is the solidus. Everything else you can match. Um, right. You could very, very easily um, um, not fall into an escaped string trick. You could, very, with a regular expression that, that just uses uh, very, very little complexity, um, uh, ES5 strings are very, very easy to safeguard against. Um, what is not easy to safeguard against is template literal because it definitely does uh, create a picture inside a picture kind of complexity that regular expressions alone don't, don't help. Tokenizing um, 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 a template literal is straightforward. Um, so, so, so the only thing that was left that wasn't that required parser knowledge of, of your syntax, some of your syntax, is the solidus. Um, and so, 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 so in terms of tokenizing accurately, unfortunately for JavaScript, 
uh, you need a little bit beyond just uh, the, the pure tokenization, but rather um, um, some lexical, um, um, you know, li like some additional um, um, knowledge of the syntax itself. Um, and, and, and I think um, what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say, well, you can't, you can't say that the two options are either your parser free, like there, there isn't any kind of parsing um, uh, effort being done, or you're a full ASP um, uh, solution that has to generate the full tree in order for it to make sense of any node. Um, and I'm trying to find the middle ground between the two, basically. Yeah. So, so Tim Disney's work did prove to me that it's possible to tokenize accurately without parsing, uh, uh, and then you know, modulo the thing about uh, closed square bracket counting in order to get back into a template literal. Uh, that's mm -hmm. obviously that kind of counting is something that a regular expression can't do. Yeah, um, uh, and I do that on a to tokenizer level. Uh, so my tokenizing contexts are literally right. when you can open something in one goal and expect it to close in the same goal after anything that opened after it, regardless of goal, matches as well. Okay. So if I remember Tim Disney's approach, in order to figure out how to interpret a solidus, he kept as context, as context a few tokens behind in sort of in, 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 uh, in yeah. memory, so, so to speak, yes. to look back at them to determine enough lexical context information to understand uh, how to parse, how to, to tokenize rather, uh, uh, how to process a, a solidus when it came across it. Mm -hmm. um, and and um, the thing about his approach though is it, it was written for ES5. Yeah. And since ES5, uh, a number of complexities um, changed. Um, so, so I, I, I took, I, I took his, um, you know, I was inspired by his approach of figuring solidus, right? Um, and I said, okay, um, we tried to, he tried to figure regular expression solidus. Um, um, I, I instead thought, okay, when, when can you divide? Because really, uh, division is a mathematical concept that has, you know, been there for like ages and it's been refined and nobody defines, uh, divides nothing um, over something. Like not, not like not the symbol for nothing, but rather absolute vacuum. You don't start any mathematical thing by saying divide and then, you know, you continue your formula. So, so that would mean that um, dividing in the start of a, uh, an expression is always a regular expression. Um, so so th it's easy to narrow down um, the logic here. But Compared to his approach, uh, the only closer that that is uh, of um, of um, you know significance, whether or not you're starting an expression, uh, is of the curly brace. Like the, when, whenever a curly brace occurs before a solidus, um, this is where logic needs to look a little bit behind. Um, so what he did is he said that when I look behind one or two tokens, I'm not literally looking one or two um, uh, scanner tokens, but I'm, I'm saying that this curly brace can contain, you know, a thousand lines of code, but it is, it is uh, the opener and the closer and everything in between that are a token in his mind. Um, you, you no, see? no, no, no. The, the, to the tokens are tokens in his model. Oh, no, no, no. Like, like he, he literally uses a curly brace, uh, triple dot curly brace to indicate that whatever you put inside that curly brace is uh, considered to be a, a different plane. You know, that, that plane is separate from your plane. So, so let, me, let me try to elaborate. Um, a function declaration can have a body, can have arguments, but it ends with, with a curl. Um, what he's saying is that because we know this closing curly, is for a function declaration. We know that anything that follows on the same line will have an, an ASI kind of um, semicolon. So it's like you're starting a new sentence on a new line, uh, or a new statement on a new line, 
So, so, so you cannot really divide uh, empty um, by something. So, so, so it's a regular expression. Uh, however, if that was, and, and, and note, I'm keeping fixed knees here until I find the best, um, uh, the best place to add more logic into this. Uh, the curly brace of uh, an object literal, if you know it is, uh, would, should be a, um, a divide because an object literal is a something, it's not a nothing. Um, and that means that the solid is following an object literal um, is always going to be a divide, um, which I don't, I don't get right um, you know, with, with my very, very uh, early implementation work. It's not the full thing. Um, but also if your function is um, not a declaration, but an expression. It looks like a declaration if you just look up to here. But if you go back, you can see that it is an expression because it started where it would have been an expression. Then that solidus is also a divide, just like the object literal. You're dividing the value of the expression, which is a function, um, um, before the solidus by whatever is after and, and so on. Um, so, so from, from his standpoint, he wasn't really talking about like one or two, um, independent, uh, things that you would call productions or, or so on in, in the atmosphere spec, but rather abstractions of, you know, this is the function body. It's a token. Um, I, I close everything that opens in it and it ends. And I know that this matches that one. So anything that goes in the middle of, of the body is a triple dot. Okay, but I mean, in order to know that a closed curly has closed the body, you need to... Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you have to walk it. You, you can't not okay. walk the body. Okay. But, but yeah, like, uh, so an invalid uh, number of uh, openers and closers or delimiters, and an unmatched delimiter will mean that this is the wrong curly brace, theoretically, right? Um, but eventually, if there was, you know, if there's a mismatch there, that's a different problem uh, to, to, to work on, um, um, you know, and, and that problem I've already handled. I, I just, depending on the context, how do you want to handle mismatches? That's, that's the question that I think I don't have clarity at this point uh, of purpose to to uh, say that we should always do this or do that. It's it's um, um, it's less complicated when you have purpose, but without purpose, you cannot abstract this. Okay. So the other thing that Tim Disney dealt with uh, that makes all of this so much harder is uh, automatic semicolon insertion. Yeah. Um, so so I don't. I write semicolons um, in a very, very, um, like I've, I've always done it the same way. Um, and I honestly did not explore ASI uh, unless in cases where I know it affects the solidus. Um, and I, I consider ASI problems to be um, um, my next stop if they are su substantial. Uh, I'm not doing an AST uh, parse, which means that in many places where a semicolon will not affect the solidus, uh, its absence or presence is um, not a problem until it's actually um, 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 you know, directly related to an assumption. Um, and I'm not making assumptions at this layer. I, I don't, I do not understand that. What, what do you mean by I'm not making assumptions? If you've like, got, if you've got, you know, something new line slash, the slash after the new line, um, uh, if the new line becomes a semicolon, then the slash after the new line uh, is not a divide. If the yeah. new line does not become a semicolon, then the slash after the new line might be a divide. Yes. So, um, so, you, can't, so, so you have to, in order to not get out of sync with the actual tokens, in order to not you know, 
get confused about if you're inside or outside a literal. Um, uh, you have to know how to interpret a slash that follows a new line. Yeah, I, I noted that I did that uh, relative to the solidus. The only, the only ASI um, I paid attention to uh, very, very clearly in my, in, my, um, in my tests so far, you know, my exploration so far, was uh, ASIs that, that, um, that um, uh, interact with a solidus. I, I did not worry about ASIs elsewhere. That's, that's, that's what I uh, um, um, did, right? So, so notice in my, my comments here, um, I did say that every time there's a keyword, uh, what follows that um, is uh, literally a regular expression. Um, even if an ASI happened, uh, the fact that there is a keyword means um, what follows it is the beginning of a, a new kind of, you know, sub-expression or expression or, you know, it's not a continuation of the expression. Um, um, so any keyword does that, uh, even an invalid one. Um, and the other, so, so ASIs where, where keywords are concerned are not a big issue. Um, I'm already saying that a function declaration um, assumes an ASI, so I make the assumption that this curly brace will <coughs> The only part that I need to do, um, um, you know, be more concrete about, I'm just making the assumption that um, if, if there's a new line after this curly brace, um, would that mean that there is an automatic ASI? I, 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 I never omit them, so I don't know really, uh, but it's, these are fairly um, um, straightforward um, to, to, you know, um, to, to uh, you know, create this list and go through them. Um, once I answer the more abstract um, complications I'm getting, right? Um, so as far, uh, you know, from my work so far, um, I do not see any other cases where an, a, a, an ASI will alter uh, how I tokenize something. Um, but again, I, I did not go looking elsewhere. That, that's all, um, you know. Okay. Our, so this, this example is interesting because a weight itself is not a keyword. Yeah. Um, so those are, those are more of, okay, so, so when do you call a keyword a keyword? Um, if, if you don't know much about the code, then um, the next thing is a weight is an identifier. So here's where if you need to uh, do a little bit more with the code, you need to start adding layers um, on top of a tokenizer. Um, well, okay, now, so my, my point here yeah. is that in contexts where a weight is treated as a keyword, yes. your claim about the solidus following it uh, in being the start of an expression and therefore a regular expression literal yeah. is true. In contexts where a weight is not treated as a keyword, uh, yeah. that very same symbol is yeah. actually a, a representative of division. Yes. Mm. So, so at this point, Back, back to where we're saying we're going to know what starts a curly brace, we will also, you know, in that logic being implemented, you know, it's, it's my next stop. Um, I'm, I'm going to know if in that curly brace, the occurrence of a weight is a keyword or not. And at that case, I will either tokenize it as a keyword or an identifier. Um, I, I just, the abstract, the, the, a, a clean abstract way to keep that knowledge before we start a curly brace is, is what I'm, I'm exploring at this point. Um, so, so you're absolutely right. If this was an identifier, then you know, this expression right here would have been a divide, not a regular expression. Um, so, so, um, so yeah, so, so, so definitely there, there is um, more to go uh, for, you know, starting, starting from here, but it all seems to relate directly just to curly braces. Um, yeah. 
I, I think I didn't understand your answer to JD's question. Uh, how do you know when you see and await? Well, whether it should be interpreted as a keyword or as an identifier. Okay, you only can know that when you when you open the curly brace that in which an await occurs of, of the function in which an await will occur. Okay. You have to you have to note if that function was an async function or not. Okay. Uh, or okay. A, a generator where yield will occur. Um, okay. You know, so so these are all stateful aspects that um, that you need a little bit more than just tokenizing to okay. to to be aware of. Okay. Uh, and and what I'm exploring to actually um, um, work you know, as an abstraction to work these problems is the idea of instead of like nodes and trees, you're, you're building a construct as you go. So um, um, it's a separate thing. I, I wasn't really prepared to get into, but uh, I can quickly show uh, what I had in mind. So obviously I closed that window. Um, Now let's, oh, sorry about that. Um, just trying to wrap it. I'll, I'll just interject that uh, with this example of weight, what I said earlier is clearly wrong. When I said that the only new tokenizing issue was, um, the, of, you know, since ES5 was template literals, I completely forgot about things like uh, how parameterized parse parse productions affect lexing. Uh, that's really pretty disturbing. Um, uh, so, so yes, so trying to tokenize ES6 sounds much worse than what, what Tim Disney was doing with ES5. ES5, yeah. So, so I'm, I'm exploring this idea of, of constructs that you could potentially say that you have a little bit of a like a, like a tokenizer with a, with a little bit of a character, right? It, it knows a little bit more than it needs to. Um, and, and it basically takes things of the ECMAScript grammar, not the whole production, but rather more than one thing that starts with a concrete or, or invariant uh, thing, you know, something you cannot confuse, and, um, and things that follow it. Um, so with constructs, um, um, one example here is that this has three constructs. Uh, the first one being the export appearing as a keyword uh, where it would be a valid construct, i.e. Um, it's, it's, it's not within um, any closures. Um, and you know it's a module source. Once that construct is, you know, known to actually be exactly what you think it is. It's a, a declaration for export. Um, then you could say, well, um, another construct that could follow that is when a star stuff that separates it from as and stuff that separates it from identifier occur. And that on, on their own, there are a construct. Um, according to the spec today, um, this together is not a valid, like this statement is not valid according to the spec today. Tomorrow it's actually valid. Um, so a third, a third construct in this is the from clause. A from clause can only occur when you have um, a import and, or an export declaration with something, not just, you know, import followed by a from clause. Um, and then a from clause can occur. Um, so I'm trying to think of, instead of ASCs, you're just saying that um, you're, you're going to find a way to abstract away uh, the noise and look at, at sub-expressions, and, and they are called constructs. Um, the um, tilde here signifies, um, you know, potentially white spaces, commas, what, whatever can be in between. Um, so, so, you know, it's, it's a very, very, um, it, it's an idea I've been exploring in, on, on different fronts, but uh, it's starting to take shape. Um, 
So when we are tokenizing, we can keep track of what we are, what construct is, is, is happening. And um, a construct is not a validity clause or a rule for validity, but rather if a construct is realized, you know, you can see that this is the construct, then you could address that construct um, um, in a valid way. Um, if, it doesn't, if it doesn't meet the criteria of the construct, then it is just not that particular one. Um, so it's more like heuristics, right? Um, so on that point, um, some early um, on that point, I tried to um, in my module shim, I tried to get this tokenizer that we've seen um, and add a layer to create those constructs to try to get all the import and export declarations from um, you know, various um, test module code that I, you know, just used to explore module uh, challenges. Um, so my constructs, you know, they, they kind of look a little bit like the documentation. Um, but clearly with a construct, you can know um, from, uh, so, so it's kind of like, like the, you know, one or more token build up this construct and once that is done, um, I can look, you know, the construct can say what follows me has an effect. Um, in, in, this, in this view, an async function will, will be a construct that will affect the curly brace of the function body that follows. And it is somewhat a tokenizer level, um, um, you know, I think it's a little bit beyond what normally tokenizers should do, but it is still valid um, um, to say that, it, you know, you could have a tokenizer that knows a little bit more about things, uh, as long as it's not doing a full AST. Um, and I think, I mean, like that, that statement is, It is correct, but the the difference between the information required to do proper tokenization of ES6 is much, much closer to the information required to do parsing of ES6 than it is to the information required to do tokenization of ES5. There are, I mean, the, the additions uh, with contextual keywords like um, await and yield and the introduction of the, uh, the fat arrow functions mean you have to hold on to a great deal in order to differentiate keywords from um, from 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 yeah. identifiers, yeah, and the difference between those matters for properly tokenizing the the input that follows them. Yeah. So, JD, um, uh, do you know whether it is possible to do a logically correct tokenization? without doing a full parse? Is, it was possible. Tim Disney showed you could do it for ES5, but as you're bringing up these points, I'm thinking maybe we've just completely lost that property. No, I, I believe it's still true. It's, it's just that you're so close to having done a full parse. Um, okay. Yeah, you don't, you don't actually need to map out the AST but you do need you do need to hold a whole lot of state. Do you need the the cover grammar 
do, can, do we just need to parse according to the cover grammar or do we have to then um, reinterpret what we parsed according to the, um, you know, the, the, the role it plays in the, in the, act, in the, 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 the semantic grammar, the abstract? I, I'm not sure. Okay. There, there are definitely situations, for instance, where you can need an arbitrarily long look ahead in order to differentiate a keyword from an identifier. But I don't know if there are any situations where that unbounded look ahead is combined with a subsequent uh, tokenization decision. Okay. Um, sorry, uh, could, could you give an example of the, um, this kind of look ahead you're talking about? Yes. Um, let me paste it in. Do you want to maybe share from your end if you have an example or give me a link in, in the um, Zoom um, like chat? Um, I, I'd rather, you know, you share from your end. Yeah, I think I find it always works better when it's the speaker who's doing the sharing because they know what they want to draw attention to. Okay, let me. Find the right place to do this. There we go. Um, Oops, that's not it. I need to find the right window. Yeah, just. Okay, can you see my screen? Yep. Yep. So I think, um, I think this is about the shortest example that I can come up with. Um, be, a async uh, being a parameter of the function becomes ambiguous in the body. So in, in this context, we, we are following it with um, what, is, what is either an argument list or a parameter list, and we don't know until we see the token that follows it. Here, it's being invoked as a function and compared to zero. And here, it is being interpreted as a function, that is, uh, as an async function. And how, what, what is the situation where we need to figure out which one it is in order to tokenize accurately? I don't know if there is one. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Like the, okay. um, the tokenization rule, it really does come down to the solidus. Um, are we looking at division or regular expression? And in this case, uh, oops, I'll just keep stacking. Um, yeah. Or, or uh, divided by equals, which is not an invalid, like, like equals divided by. Um, you know. So yeah, so equals divided by, that's definitely a regular expression. Um, um, is it not, uh, is there like equals divide, doesn't that um, uh, like, like equals, uh, oh, plus equals, so divide equals. Like, yeah, div divide equals is a thing, but that's, like, uh, yeah. Well, okay, no, that's, that's actually, 
one, right? So, yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> so what do we have? Uh, and then, yeah, divided by i, because uh, divided by uh, well, if you add i to your arguments, then then you know you're you're complicating the parsing complexity. You don't have to go all the way to i. You could just say I like i more than b. <laughs> no, that's fine. <laughs> I, I don't care. Um, <laughs> so in so in this case, um, let's see. Does it matter? For a construct, it's it's not a look ahead because a construct uh, only says async is a keyword if there's a fat arrow or a curly brace but curly brace where this would have been inside a curly brace as in this was a method. So if the keyword uh, function occurred after async, it's, it's a, the beginning of the construct. If async occurred curly braces and Tim Disney says everything inside that, cur uh, that round brace, sorry, is considered one token, um, obviously it takes parsing and all of that, like tokenization. But when, once you balance that round bracket, a construct of an async arrow function is only that when it has the fat arrow. So, so what, I'm, what I'm saying is tokenizing this literal like one-off tokens is not enough. Parsing it all the way is too much. Saying a construct occurs when the fat arrow fulfills that this is an async keyword. Um, is the middle ground between parsing um, and tokenization. So, but the question here is that whether, whether the treatment of this, whether, whether that is tokenized as a regular expression literal or as part of an arithmetic expression, uh, is that dependent upon Round brackets, yes. ha, round brackets, um, 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 mean divide. Um, I think. Let me let me check what I do. I forget. Uh, I mean, we could make it even worse, right? If we. Oops. Can, can, can you keep it that, that bad until I I just figure out what I don't remember in my head? So. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Let, let's leave it bad enough, and then do it like even worse. Um, yeah. Um, so, so I, I've, I've assumed that um, a round bracket uh, is always followed by divide. Can we have a round bracket that is followed by a regular expression? I don't think so. I don't think so either. Yeah, uh, because round brackets are, are very, very natural in, in math, right? So I think whoever thought about this and, and you know, there are so many people before it, um, you put stuff in the spec. Um, so, so I'm talking, you know, in general, people who have thought about the syntax um, to affect uh, solid, you know, the way we, we perceive it now, um, you know, might have felt that it would be a foot gun if a curl, if a round bracket is followed by a regular expression, by a regular expression, yeah. Yeah, I think that's true. So, so this, I is like, not a, this is not a case where you get an ambiguous tokenization. And, and I really like to, um, you know, play those human aspects that people who write the spec try to think of other human beings using the spec, and, you know. And so on. So, so you will find that in in, in parsing, uh, a lot of things you could just intuitively rely on on what is reasonable for other human beings. Um, I'm going to be a little snide here and say that uh, if they had thought about what was reasonable for other human beings, they never would have introduced semicolon insertion. Into the language. <laughs> right. I, I think when they thought about the what, where you need to write. Uh, where you need the colon, you know, standard or, or, or semi-standard was prettier. Uh, 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 so, so I think when they found themselves fighting all the time, they just said that the, hu the reasonable human um, uh, thing to do here 
is to introduce ASI so that people don't have this kind of argument every time they talk JavaScript. Yeah, I, I, I understand that ASI <laughs> was introduced thinking it would ease the burden on the programmer, uh, but it wasn't thought through well. I, I think the burden of the programmer making the case why they don't want to put a colon here like a semicolon. <laughs> it's when, when they argued about it, that they said, okay, we need to make it automatic so that people don't have these fights all the time. <laughs> yes. <laughs> it's, it's obviously, I will, we will never know why they were introduced. Well, actually, I mean, we probably could have just asked Brendan. Um, <laughs> but uh, I mean, Brendan is, is very, very good about remembering reasons for everything never ever gets defensive it's really extraordinary how he just never ever gets defensive or feels like he needs to to you know to justify or defend some some old decision that he made he's just very very clear-eyed um and factual about the history yeah um so, so I'm, I'm considering, you know, those are refinement matters. So where, when, when a yield is a keyword, it's obviously always followed by a regular expression. When a yield is not, um, so, but, but what I'm thinking of, you know, my parsing approach is that only if you give it the context that this yield is in a generator body, will you be able to actually solve the solidus here. Um, sometimes you'll have an expression that doesn't have that kind of knowledge. Um, and that means that you've really chosen a bad approach to segment your code and throw it at the tokenizer. Um, what, what assumption would you make in the absence of knowledge of whether it's a generator or not? Um, I, is I, I think it's fair for you to make the assumption that you are parsing a generator ex nihilo right like you've that, that you have been given the start of the source text that is responsible for producing a given goal and and make no assumptions about it occurring somewhere in the middle so don't don't assume because you see a potential keyword that signifies a potential goal that you are in that goal don't make this kind of assumption. Because um, some people say to disambiguate um, modules in, in, in Node.js, for instance, being CommonJS or, or ECMAScript, uh, just look for module exports. And, and, you know, and there are so many ways you can go wrong with that. Yeah. Uh, you know, um, or, or, or make sure there's a module, ES module syntax in there, and then it cannot be CommonJS. Um, well, not if I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> you know. Well, yeah. Th so th those are the, the ambiguous cases, um, and I would. It would it would be fair for you to have any kind of consumer of source text, that uh, accepted, a goal, a parse goal. And. Had some configuration, whether it was the default or not, that it would switch to a different goal when it encountered um, something in the text indicating that it should switch. Yeah. But that's, that's not what I'm talking about here because the decision, you have some goal in mind and I'm saying uh, you, whether, it was, whether it was explicit or implicit, you have a goal and make the assumption that you are parsing complete source text uh, in pursuit of that parse goal. So if we were to, if we were to hand you just this uh, without having given the preceding function that you would assume. It, it is a, an identifier due to the absence of a clue that it is a generator function. Correct. Yeah. Cause, cause top level, um, um, any global code or module code or things that are not wrapped inside the generator function are not a generator function. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, you know, someone, yeah. If someone, you know, wants to parse 
what they understand to be the body of a generator function, then that's the start again. Exactly. Yes. Sound, sounds or, or, or as some context, um, you know, in one form or another, it wouldn't necessarily have to change the parse goal. Uh, in fact, in that case, it wouldn't, it likely would not change the parse goal depending on how you structured it. Um, All right. but, the, but the idea there being that you could propagate information that is interesting, but you should not make assumptions that aren't warranted by the input you have encountered. All right. So, so um, I, I really appreciate, um, um, you know, this, um, um, like you, you've definitely given me a, a, a far less abstract, um, you know, um, approach to, um, you know, philosophically address a few of the issues I'm having. Um, so, but definitely this idea of yield without indication of generator, whether it's configura configuration or um, literally because it is the code, um, defaulting to the fact that, you know, yeah. So, so, so yeah, thank you so much for that. Um, now, by the way, there's, uh, I just remembered that there is one crossover issue, uh, which is an NXD parsing issue that, uh, for which I'm going to make a radical suggestion. HTML comments? Or, or HTML, yes, HTML comments. Yes. Uh, right now, HTML comments are in NXB. That means that specification-wise, um, uh, there's no reliable way, there's no reliable way to parse at all because you don't know whether the code is intended for a platform that, that recognizes HTML comments or not. Um, yes. And uh, as far as I know, all parsers actually do recognize HTML comments, although I need to ask the, J the XS guys whether they do. I don't know if they do. But if all of the other ones do, and XS is the only one that does not, uh, I'm still going to recommend that HTML comments, this, this thing that's just incredibly ugly that I wish I could get rid of, if I, since I can't get rid of it, I would rather not make it optional. Yes. Because making it optional is even more costly than having, it, having the wrong thing be mandatory. Um, so, so we should just make the HTML comment thing mandatory. So, so I, I have one question for you because I've, I've been trying to make heads and tails. Like, obviously, this was specced according to how it already behaved when somebody made it work for some reason. Yep. Right. Uh, so, but but I, I I look at it and I, I tell myself like, I, if it is um, a multi-line, then it should be. Um, um, literally, it should follow the same rules as the multi-line comment. And if it is not a multi-line, then it should follow the single-line comments. But the way it is yeah. in the spec, um, if we put it, um, if, if we're moving it out of Annex B, could we um, see if it can, can become just like normal comments, like a multi-line comment? Can't do it. No? No. Uh, and by the way, I mean, I, aesthetically, I completely agree with you. It actually caused a responsible disclosure against Kaha um, uh, when somebody successfully attacked Kaha because when we added the multi-line comment recognition to Kaha, um, I think it was actually we were using Acorn. Acorn assumed that it was multi-line when it was not. Um, and the result was that somebody was able to do a security attack against Kaha because of that. Um, so uh, uh, whatever the current behavior is, if it's universal, the only thing we can do uh, is to, um, the only option we have is to change it from optional to mandatory. We cannot change how it works. Okay. 
if we did change how it works, let me explain just the consequence. If we did change how it works, then there would be a transition period in which some mm. browsers work the old way and some browsers work the new way. And we don't want that. that. And anything that did a pre-parse based on one assumption could be attacked on browsers that work the other way. Okay, so I'm gonna have to do a little bit more thing. Like in my older, the legacy parse that I did, I, I added them just you know for kicks. Um, and then when I tried to reconcile what I'm doing with the spec, I, I did not understand the spec really. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm sure I read it three times before it even occurred to me that it meant what it literally said. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to bring up the spec in front of me just, just to remind myself of it was a really bad experience to try to understand it. I think Annex B also suffers from the fact that it's not written to be read. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it, it's written because it's already a matter of fact. And, and, you know, if you're trying to learn how to implement ECMAScript, um, you don't you don't need to know about Annex B unless you are Annex B. Well, the thing is, everybody except maybe XS uh, implements the uh, stuff in Annex B because everybody other than XS, their primary target is to work in a browser. So it looks like you're correct, Mark. I'm going to find, I think it's this one again. I'm correct about what? So uh, XS is different from the other okay. engines in this, in, in the case of HTML comments. Okay. Um. Okay, I should warn the XS guys before next week. The, the 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 complicating part for me was um, was more of how it interacted with uh, 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 like a normal multi-line comment where after the closer of a multi-line comment you have HTML close comment optional. Um, so I wasn't clear if that meant that basically you're still in comment or not. You know that that part for me was where I struggled. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, if, if it is going to be moved out of NXB, maybe at least we can have very clean uh, um, articulation uh, for it, um, not just the um, syntax. So, uh, so um, changes to the wording to make things clearer without making them any less precise. Yes. Uh, um, uh, any, any such, um, you know, rewording, you should just submit as a pull request. Uh, people have been doing that. They've generally gotten accepted. If there's nothing controversial about them, people always appreciate an improvement in the wording. Yeah. So, um, and that's really orthogonal to the issue about whether we promote it from Annex B to the main spec. I, I think it's it's um, suboptimal to keep them in Annex B. We can only start to address their issues either by promoting it or demoting them. Um, but uh, leaving them Annex B is definitely bad um, um well we can't we can't demote them uh yeah. the and nxb is as demoted as they can get yeah yeah so so anything that cannot go down has to go up <laughs> well, <it's still> <laughs> but, in, but in this case it should go up yeah no it shouldn't stay where it is that 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 is the conclusion yeah so okay i'm going to go ahead it's it's i went way over this time um, I'm going to go ahead and adjourn. Uh, glad, glad I got all this recorded. I'm going to stop recording.